Hi, and welcome back to Codex. Our speaker today is Joseph Wasway from the University of Maryland College Park. Joe is a PhD student studying quantum information theory. Today, he will tell us about projective torque designs. Take it away, Joe. And I'm sorry, I think I just butchered your name. But <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. No, it's closer, closer than most, <laughs> so no worries. Yeah, I really appreciate the invite. Um, and uh, yeah, so as he said, I'm, I'm a PhD student in quantum information theory. Um, and indeed, my my other co-authors were all physicists. I think that's sort of an important caveat. Uh, I hope, uh, yeah, we all like math, but you know, we're certainly not mathematicians. So hopefully, it, it goes okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is joint work with um, uh, Connor Mooney, is a, a PhD student. Uh, Adam Ehrenberg's a, a PhD student, and then my co-advisor, Professor Alexei Borshkov. Um, and yeah, so the sort of context uh, is the way we got interested in this stuff is from quantum information theory, um, thinking about things and um, generating sort of quantum codes, designing quantum codes, um, quantum state designs, tomography, and, and these types of things. So that's sort of the overarching context, I suppose. Um, so yeah, this is the rough overview. Um, they're somewhat disjointed. This is kind of a... We, one thing that's we kind of liked, but also is, yeah, this is sort of a little bit, uh, these projective torque designs seem to just be related to various things. So I'm hopefully just gonna kind of jump through the things and summarize them. But so hopefully it's not too disjointed, but um, so let me maybe begin by just making my, the definition of a T design that I will use. Sorry, I'm just moving the uh, videos out of the way. Um, so this is sort of not the standard definition, but it's the one I'll use. Uh, it's roughly the standard one, which is given a measure space uh, and a set of polynomials, then a T design is just another measure space which exactly integrates um, polynomials up to degree T. So usually people will require this, <clears throat> this design X, the measure space X to be finite and to be, to be discrete and finite. And indeed, usually they require the, it to be like a uniformly weighted just sum. Sometimes they'll allow weights. Um, that's mostly what we'll also focus on today, but for full generality, for some other things, we actually like it to just be a full measure space. Um, and uh, so for example, here's some things that are of, of relevance in quantum information theory, some spaces um, that you might wanna have designs on. Um, let me just maybe point, so one point of notation is that I'll, I'll just notate the complex sphere by omega sub d. Um, and this talk is obviously focusing on the projective toric design, which I'll yeah. denote by this, which I'll sort of define later. Um, and, and so in, in, in quantum information theory, people are usually interested in complex projective uh, or quantum state designs. So when M is the complex projective space or when M is the projective unitary group, Sometimes we're interested in when M is a unitary group, but usually it's just the projective unitary group. Um, I'll sort of argue or you know, roughly argue today that we should also, quantum people should also be interested in uh, simplex design, projective toric design. Um, and then one last thing that I won't talk about too much, but I sort of want to point it out a few times because I think it's sort of interesting is um, uh, when the space that you want to make a design for is a sort of function space, this, um, at, I'm denoting the space of temperate distributions by this just SR prime, um, so the dual of short space. Um, this shows up at, in when trying to do anal analogs of quantum state designs for infinite dimensional quantum systems. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll sort of maybe hopefully mention this a few times, um, but it's, a, it's sort of an interesting idea that I think people haven't looked into too much is working with designs on these sort of more general bases. Um, so let me just maybe define a torque design. So throughout this talk, I'll let T just be R mod two pi Z um, and a torque design or, or trick also called a trigonometric cubature rule uh, is just a, uh, again, I'll, I'll let it be a general measure space such that it exactly integrates these types of functions. So the functions are monomials on the torus so they're just exponentials uh, of, <clears throat> of the uh, sort of coordinates of the tour, this phi, phi sub j, so each phi is an element of Tn. And uh, the sort of filtration that defines your, the degrees of your polynomials is uh, that this, this, yeah, this condition that um, the sum needs to be less than equal to T. Um, 
Uh, and one sort of hint that sometimes these come up in quantum information is that they, uh, they're they the same as designs on the maximal torus of the unitary group. Um, and we're interested in the unitary group. So a general theme throughout the sort of, this sort of talk, or I guess, yeah, is uh, really what defines a projective design or what makes projective designs different, I suppose. Um, and I think really the answer is the polynomial structure. So for example, on the two torus, uh, you have you have to worry about all these types of monomials that you don't have to worry about on the projective two torus. So for example, this sort of e to the i phi one plus phi two is a is a monomial you have to exactly integrate if you want to have a two design. But you don't have to exactly integrate such a function, such a monomial on the projective torus, because this is just not a well-defined function. And so the sort of the same, the same holds for um, so complex spherical versus projective complex spherical, where projective complex spherical is just complex projective or quantum state designs. Um, same thing sort of holds. Uh, and then same for unitaries. And so fundamentally in quantum, the reason we're always interested in projective is because all of our, everything that you can sort of calculate is always independent of a, of a global phase. And so we're always working in a projective Hilbert space. And that's why almost always we're only interested in the projective unitary group uh, or the projective sphere. So that's sort of why they come up. So with this sort of distinction in mind, this is how we define a projective toric design which is the same as a torque design, but the monomials are different. Um, so we let this P T of N just be T of N mod uh, sort of global U1 phase. Uh, and we let a projective torque T design be a measure space uh, such that these monomials are exactly integrated. So the monomials now are the same as before, except that uh, yeah, if, if the phi's are offset by a global phase, it doesn't change anything. And so they're well-defined functions. And um, yeah, I don't know, I'm, maybe I should have said that, that the measure we're using throughout is always just the Haar measure on these groups. Um, and again, a projective torque design is the same as a design on the maximal torus of the projective unitary group. And so this is why, again, they sort of show up, in, well, one reason why they might show up in quantum. Uh, and uh, one other thing I wanted to say, and I forget, and I'm sure it'll come up. Oh, yes. So I'll also sometimes actually be considering n is strictly infinity. Uh, so even, but also with the toric designs, so you can just let like consider t infinity as the infinite product of, of t's, or u ones, I guess. Um, and these show up in this sort of infinite dimensional case that Hopefully I'll talk about it a little bit. So this is the definition of projective torque design that we'll be using. And again, to sort of set the context within quantum, uh, another reason they come up is through this parameterization of quantum states. So if you take a point on the simplex and a point on the torus in this case, um, you can parameterize the complex sphere. It's not a unique parameterization, but it's parameterization. Um, so, right, so this sort of, sorry, I'm using, I'm using uh, the sort of Dirac notation and the quantum notation for vectors, kind of horrible notation, uh, this P comma phi, but in any case, uh, this is a parameterization of a element of the complex sphere. Um, so, yeah, so for example, here on the right, we have a point on the centroid of the simplex yeah. and then a point on the three torus. And that gives us this linear combination of these three basis vectors of our of, of uh, C three, um, and the centroid will you know gives us the uniform superposition. And what you can show is that if you take a simplex T design and a toric T design, and you combine them, then you can yield a complex spherical T design. And the same thing happens with um, a simplex design and a projective toric T design, they combine to yield a complex projective T design, quantum state T design. Um, and so sort of from the start of the project, this was initially how we started thinking about projective toric T designs, it was to, for, because of their relation to quantum state design. Um, and the, the sort of fundamental reason for this, um, this connection is just that, um, Volume integration over the complex sphere is equivalent to volume integration over flat simplex cross the flat torus. 
Uh, and then similarly, volume integration over complex projective space is equivalent to volume integration over the simplex times the uh, projective torus. Uh, and this is like, I mean, I guess you can either just carry through Jacobian factors or you can work explicitly with differential forms of, and then, you know, it's sort of, yeah, sort of just goes through. Um, so that's one thing that's necessary is that the measures are just product measures. Um, the other thing that's sort of necessary is that um, the, um, when you sort of do this mapping of this parameterization, the degrees uh, of the, the sort of degree of the mapping doesn't change the degree of the relevant polynomials. So it's sort of important that, uh, that uh, when you have a degree T polynomial on the simplex and a degree T polynomial on the projected torus, that when you do this parameterization, you, you get a degree T polynomial on the on complex projective complex projective space. Uh, right. So right. So when you concatenate these designs, you yield designs on the bigger space. And then again, to bring up this sort of infinite dimensional case, um, if you sort of slightly redefined uh, or have a sort of suitable definition of a design on, on an infinite simplex, then you can, this, this sort of same result holds um, that you can combine a design on this sort of infinite simplex and a design on the infinite projective torus and you'll yield uh, these designs on the space of temperate distributions, which uh, in, this, in this previous work we called a rigged continuous variable quantum state design. Uh, so that's sort of why we, that's the reason why we allow N to be infinity sometimes, you know, deal with T infinity. And that's also the reason, the fundamental reason why we're interested in um, measure spaces as designs rather than um, just all, just discrete sets of points. It's because for these infinite dimensional space, or at least for this infinite dimensional space, the temp space of temperate distributions, we were never able to find any, um, any discrete set of points. I don't have a proof that it's not possible, but we were never able to find a discrete set of points that sort of yields a design. My, my guess is that it's impossible. Um, but nonetheless, you can take a sort of complicated measure space and then, and then uh, find a design, which is a much, much simpler measure space. I'll show one later, hopefully, but um, you know, for, for example, on the, on the infin infinite torus, you have a, a sort of infinite dimensional uh, uh, integral with the sort of infinite infinite product of of uh, hard measures on each each individual uh, u one factor, and then you can, for example, have a two design by just having an integral over two phases. And so that's yeah. So that's why we deal with the measure spaces instead of just discrete spaces. Um, and then okay, so we're going to work with sort of one specific simplex design over and over again. So maybe I'll just point it out. So the simplex is just this you know, set of probability distributions on D elements. Um, and if you take the centroid of the simplex and the extremal points of the simplex, then this forms a two design. It forms a weighted two design. It's, it's, not, a, it's, it's not a uniform, uh, in some dimensions it is, but in most dimensions, it's not a uniform uh, two design. But in any case, it's a two design. Um, and the nice thing about so there's many other simplex two designs. There are smaller simplex two designs. So I think the smallest smallest you can go is D. Uh, for, the, for the D minus one simplex, you need at least D points, I think. This two design has D plus one points. Um, but the reason that it ends up being nice is because, so when you concatenate uh, a simplex and a torus, or projective torus design, torque design, when you uh, put the torus or the, the phases on any of the extremal points, it just don't do anything um, because all you get is, uh, uh, yeah, they, they don't do anything because uh, the, the only thing in the projective torus that matters is sort of relative phases. Relative phases is between elements of your, super, of your linear combination. And so when you, when you don't have a linear combination, when you just have a single element, then the phases don't do anything. And so for this particular two design, the phases only interact with the centroid. Um, so that's why we'll, that's why this is sort of a nice one. So uh, yeah, so now I'll sort of talk about the connection between these projective torque designs and complete sets of mutually unbiased bases. It's kind of a, it's, it's, it's sort of a, not a particularly 
strong, what's well, not as strong of a connection as we would like. I don't know. It's sort of feels like there's probably a stronger connection, but I guess we're not, we're not uh, totally sure. But so, right. So the definition of a complete set of mutual unbiased bases is, is as follows. You have uh, D plus one orthonormal bases of C to the D. And they form a complete set of mutually unbiased bases if uh, if you take any any two vectors in two different bases and they have this constant this uh one you know one over d overlap, um, and the reason that this comes up you know for, for context the reason that this comes up in quantum information theory is uh it comes along with sort of uncertainty in in measurements, so there's sort of the standard I guess just in Fourier analysis the standard like if I if you have a a function which is very, very uh, focused in position space, then it's very broad in momentum space and vice versa. This, and in, in quantum, for quantum measurements, this has the implication that if, if you have, uh, if you can measure, say, a particle's position very well, then you, then you can't measure its momentum very well and vice versa. Mutual unbiased spaces are just a generalization of this, um, although to, to finite dimensional systems. Um, so, uh, you know, a set of D plus one mutually unbiased bases is just to say that you have D plus one different bases that you can measure measure your uh, quantum system in. And when you, if you measure in one basis, it tells you nothing about what you would have measured in any other basis. Uh, that's sort of what makes them mutually unbiased. Uh, and the reason that it's D plus one bases is because that's just, uh, that's just, the, that's the maximum that you can have, maximum number of mutually unbiased bases you can have. I think that was proven in... I don't remember, but it was a long time ago. Um, now you can equivalently just rephrase this definition just in terms of phases, uh, because you know you could, for example, just let this basis B zero be. Uh, or you express you express the bases B one through B D each state in in those bases in terms of the vectors in B zero, and then because of this mutual and bias condition, um, the vectors in B1 through BD need to be linear combinations, uh, sort of uniform, uniform linear combinations of vectors in B0, but you can have some different phases. And so you can just equivalently redefine this, this uh, <clears throat> complete set of MUBs just in terms of a set of D cubed, D cubed phases. Um, and yeah, so if you just work it out, these are the two conditions that you need. Uh, so each theta superscript ij is an element of the d torus. So the subscript k just denotes the, the position of the tuple. But if you just look at the conditions one and two, these conditions have these conditions really are conditions on the on the projective torus, not on the torus. And again, the reason that this is the case is because in quantum you're only ever interested in in uh, in things up to global phases. So really, what this is, really this is a condition. This is a collection of projective, uh, sorry. This is a collection of points on the projective torus. Uh, and and you and they need to satisfy certain conditions on the projective torus. And right, so in particular, you can take a collection of, of d square uh, d squared points on the projective torus, and they form a complete set of MUBs uh, if and only if. They satisfy the same orthonormality condition from before, um, but then in in place of the mutually unbiased condition, you can just replace it with uh, that they need it needs to be a projective toric two design. Uh, and one thing that would be nice would be to somehow I don't know get rid of condition one or show that there's another. Uh, yeah, but we, yeah, we haven't done that. I don't, I don't know if it's possible, but I would you know it'd be nice to to make us somehow a stronger connection between MUBs and projective toric design, two designs, just somehow getting rid of the first condition or, or reducing its strength or something like that. Um, so the, 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 the connection, the, the connection between these two is, is again, through this sort of simplex two design. Um, so the point is that if you have, if you have a projective toric two design and you concatenate it with this simplex two design that we have down here, then you get a quantum state two design. And if that quantum state two design also satisfies orthonormality, then then it has to be a complete set of MEBs. Um, 
right? So for example, let me, you know, let me just give sort of an example. If you take this set of phases, uh, if you take a, take a prime, if you let the dimension that you're interested in be a prime, then um, if you define your phases in this way, um, then you can see that they satisfy both of the necessary conditions. <clears throat> and the, this is a this is a projective toric two design of size d squared or p squared. Sorry, because we're letting p be a prime. Then when you concatenate it with that simplex design, design but before, then you then you get your just to some basis, and then you get um, each point in the in the design corresponds to a state uh, or sorry a vector um, that vector being a uniform superposition. Uh, but with different phases. And this is the canonical example. Of, I think it's the first example, I'm not sure, but it's the example of a complete set of MUBs from the first paper. I think, I'm pretty sure this is the first paper on uh, MUBs <clears throat> from 1989. And you can generalize this construction up here to instead of D being a prime, you can let it be a prime power. And then instead of this like J square, J K plus I K squared or something, you you have a field, a field trace. Um, and then you then again you get complete set of MUBs, um, which is the one from this from the original construction. <clears throat> um, and then finally, you can take the same projective torus two design and generalize it to the infinite projective torus. Uh, and this is again where we need measure spaces instead of discrete spaces. So in, before we had this two pi over p uh, two pi k. Over, so like two pi j over p and two pi i over p, where i j labeled points each for each i and j you have a point in the projective torus. Here, in place of i and j, you just have phases theta and phi. And uh, but otherwise, you still have the same uh, the same sort of dependence on the on k. But now k is goes to the natural numbers. Um, and this set is now a p t infinity two design because it just satisfies this. Um, and when you concatenate this with the simplex, <clears throat> with this, this sort of analogous simplex two design here, but for infinite dimensions, which is why I sort of have this in quotes, but in any case, then, then you end up getting these um, and these vectors, well, they're not vectors, but they're elements of the space of temperate distributions. Um, Based on you know uh, if you act um, these these things act on uh, functions in short space to give you numbers and right and so this set of uh, points of short space temperate distribution sorry this set of temperate distributions gives you a two design on the set of temperate distributions and that's this sort of rigged continuous variable quantum state two design it's sort of a mouthful but. Um, I think that's the last I'll be saying of this infinite dimensional stuff, but. Um, right, okay, so now I'll switch gears and talk about um, uh, sort of bounds on the minimal size of projective toric designs. And this is where we get into, here we'll, uh, yeah, we'll talk about root lattices and crystal ball sequences. So let me just define those quickly. So. First, we have the root lattice of the of, of the maximal torus of pu n, uh, which is the project, which is just p of t to the n, um, and you have these roots of the lattice, uh, which are so e, e i and e j are are just sort of standard basis vectors, and the roots are e i minus e j. Then the set of all points on this on this root lattice that's at most a distance s away from the origin is just uh, the s fold sum of r. And the crystal ball numbers are defined by the size of this set. So it's the number of points which are a distance s away from the origin. And uh, Conway and Sloan proved that this, uh, these crystal ball numbers have this uh, closed form expression given by this hypergeometric function which you can <clears throat> which you can write out as a fin uh, finite sum. I think it's I think it's a finite sum. Yeah, it's a finite sum um, of some like binomial coefficients and stuff. But uh, but yeah. So I once <laughs> I once saw a, a blog post by somebody I forget who, but he said uh, 
he said all of undergraduate, all of high school and undergraduate math or something can be summarized by the hypergeometric function. So yeah, so it's it's encapsulated by this, I suppose. So now to put to place a bound on this the size of a minimal projective torque design, um, we can define. Uh, just slightly changed notation. So define this the set of all points on the root lattice that are at most s uh, a distance s away from the origin. We define it as this sort of PSN set, and it's equivalently written as you have these two <clears throat> these two vectors QR. Uh, the difference between Q and R whenever Q and R the sum of these is equal to s, and this crystal ball sequence is is the size of the set. And uh, an element of this set corresponds to a monomial on the projective torus of degree s. And you can just, yeah, you can just see that, I guess, from this, that since the sum of this is s and the sum of this is s, it's a, it's a valid monomial on the projective torus. <clears throat> and it's a, yeah, it's degree s. Or less than s, it can be, yeah, this can also be less than s. But, uh, so for example, if you just let Q, like Q1 equal R1, and these two just, for J equals one, these just cancel out. And so then you can get, uh, yeah, you can get smaller than degree S2. Uh, but yeah, so this, this sort of PSN gives you the set of all polynomials or monomials on the space. So then it's not too surprising. I mean, most, most design bounds, as far as I know, are sort of, <clears throat> are sort of proven based on the dimension of the space of polynomials. And so here we have um, the, 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 a bound on, this, on the size of a uh, T design on the projective torus is in terms of this crystal ball sequences. Uh, so in this case, this bound only works if N is finite. Um, and then we let X be discrete because that's how we're <laughs> defining what the size is. Um, and, but this, but X, it doesn't have to be a uniform uniform uh, design, it can be a weighted design, but it's a weighted finite discrete design, then the size has to be, um, has to satisfy this bound. And furthermore, if T, <clears throat> if T is even and X saturates this bound, then X has to be uniformly weighted. Um, and we conjecture that this bound is tight for even T. It's most likely not tight for odd t, but I think it's I think we think we think that it's tight for even t. And we know that it's tight for t is two, which I suppose I'll show later. Um, oops. Right, so uh, so that was bounding the size of these projective toric designs. Um, now I can uh, now we can talk about constructing these toric designs. And here we'll use, we'll construct them uh, via different sets. So we'll start off with the, uh, the uh, T infinity case, just cause it's, I don't know if it's simpler, but it's the same, but yeah. So we'll just start off with that case. Um, and suppose that <clears throat> we not only want X to be a design, but we also want it to be a group, a, su a subgroup of, uh, yeah, we want it to be a group. If we, just if we decide that we want it to be isomorphic to to just T or just U1, then then it has to be generated by some element, um, some tuple of, of integers. Uh, and then if you just sort of plug this, this into uh, your T design condition, then you find that X is a T design if and only if it satisfies this uh, condition. And these uh, double braces on the right are denote multi-set. So it's just whether or not these two things are equal up to reordering, but they, uh, they yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so you don't, you don't delete duplicate elements, I guess. Um, and so this condition here is exactly the condition of a BT different set, uh, which is a, object defined in additive combinatorics. I think they've been studied for like a really long time. Uh, and this is definitely where, like I'm certainly not read into the literature in any, in any sense, but I think these have been studied for a very long time. Um, 
And yeah, so that what the condition is saying is that the you have a tuple, or a, obviously yeah, you have a, you have a set of of uh, integers. Uh, I suppose usually we just say these are positive integers. So you have a set of positive integers, and the sum of any uh, t elements of that set needs to be unique. So for example, if you let uh, z a, uh, you know, so a is, is from a goes from one to infinity. If you let t a be um, if you let ZA be T, T to the A, then this group with its Haar measure is a PT infinity T design because this, uh, this Z defines a different, a PT different set, uh, which is sort of easy to see if you think about, if you think about writing uh, Z sub A in base T, then it's sort of easy to see that any sum needs to be unique, I suppose. I don't know if it's worth going through the exercise, but uh, this is sort of the, I think this is sort of the simplest BT set Now, if you go instead to um, finite dimensions now, instead, instead of this t infinity, if you go to finite dimensions, then the same thing holds. But now, instead of uh, saying that each you know, the sum of t elements needs to be unique, if we say that the sum of t elements needs to be unique mod n, then we get a pt mod m set of size n. And sort of uh, analogous to the result here uh, with the PT infinity, uh, you can show that if you if you want your PTN T design to be isomorphic to the integers mod M, then you just have to have a PT mod M set of size N. And as a corollary of this, uh, since we have a bound on the size of PT uh, projective torque designs, then the corollary is that any different set, any BT mod M set, has to has has to have size satisfying uh, this this bound, which again is probably not tight for T being odd, but I think it might be tight for T being even. Um, and this and it's this is one again this is one of those things also that. Um, it's very possible this is in the literature somewhere. I wasn't able to find it, but this literature I think is like super old. So it's very possible that I missed it. Um, so maybe it's known if this is tight or not, I'm not sure. <clears throat> so hopefully, yeah, if anyone knows, please let me know. <clears throat> so uh, now studying, uh, so so with, with these different sets, so like sort of as I showed here, you can, you can, with a different set, you can construct a projective torque T design. So with these different, if, if you have a construction of different sets, then this gives you constructions of projective torque designs. <clears throat> and there are these different sets constructed by Singer in, um, I think it was the twenties, it might've been the forties. Uh, and this was, I think this might've actually been before people started studying different sets, I could be wrong, but I think he was studying something quite different. He was studying something in, in projective geometry, um, fi finite projective geometry, finite projective planes or something, yeah. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't know if he knew what he was constructing at the time, but he construct, what he effectively constructed was these BT mod this thing sets <clears throat> of size N whenever n minus one is a prime power. And the reason that prime power comes into play is because his construction sort of crucially uses finite fields. Um, so you need prime power. Um, it's a, I'm actually not sure if it's an efficient construct, like a, if, if, so it's, he, it's a very straightforward sort of algorithm to generate the difference set. So like I, I coded his algorithm in Mathematica you work with finite fields and stuff, but I don't actually know. I suppose I should have thought. I haven't really thought about it carefully, but I don't actually know if it's efficient construction. Like, you know, I was sort of easily able to go up to n is, I don't know, like fifteen or something, and t is whatever. But uh, but I don't know if it's if if you go to large n and large t, if this is an efficient algorithm to construct these sets. I'm not sure, but I think they might be because it's more. I think it's more or less. It's just the arithmetic. 
and uh, taking mod all in a finite field. So, um, right, so via these, so using these Singer sets, this gives us an explicit construction of P, of a projective torque T designs of this size for all N and T, where N prime is any integer greater than N such that N prime minus one is a prime power. So of course we just choose the smallest one because that gives us the smallest design. Um, but actually sort of interestingly, uh, this is a slight tangent, but one of the other places that we were thinking about using these uh, toric designs uh, is uh, in something we called quantum spherical codes, which are um, error correcting codes for infinite dimensional sort of bosonic systems. And there, uh, so when you're generating codes, you know, oftentimes you don't just want a small number of points. You also want to have good sort of distance between points so that, so that um, they're robust to the sort of the most errors. And what we're doing is just sort of some preliminary numerics with these singer set designs to using using these toric designs to uh, to generate these quantum spherical codes and in some, you know oftentimes having the smallest design is actually not best for codes because you don't get as good distance sometimes like sometimes you, a bigger design actually gives you better distance and uh, yeah so in any case that's sort of why I said that n prime doesn't actually doesn't have to be the smallest integer but for the smallest design, it, it should just be the smallest. Um, yeah, so this gives us an infinite infinite family of explicit uh, projective toric T designs uh, for every N and every T. <clears throat> and furthermore, they are almost asymptotically uh, tight in the sense that they, they are asymptotically tight in N uh, so if you, you know, we have this bound in terms of the crystal ball sequences. Um, and if you just let, if you assume T is fixed and you say, let's take N to infinity, then, um, then I think these two bounds match. But if you also let T sort of grow, then th this doesn't quite match the lower bound. Asymptotically, these are sort of almost exact, almost tight in some sense. So one other thing is that uh, if you if you take a, a projective toric design and then you sort of twirl over a global <clears throat> a global U1 design, then you can turn any projective toric design into just a toric design. Uh, basically, that uh, you know a projective toric design integrates most of the or a lot of the polynomials that you care about for the toric design, but then by by twirling over this extra global phase that that deals with the rest of the polynomials. Um, and so this therefore gives explicit, you know, our, our the singer construction gives explicit toric designs of this size for all T and N. Um, as far as I, as far as I know, so this uh, so these toric designs also go under the name of trig trigonometric cubature rules. Um, as far as I know, these uh, this is not a construction that, that people have had before, but uh, yeah, and. Uh, I think these might also be asymptotically tight and with, with matching with bounds that people have made for these trigonometric controls, but I'm not sure about that. Um, cool, yeah, so see so these singer sets. So one other thing that maybe I wanted to mention was that these singer sets are right. So he studied these in the, in the in, when he was studying project, uh, finite projective geometry. And these complete sets of mutually unbiased bases are also conjectured, I don't think it's proven, but they're conjectured to be related to finite projective geometry um, or possibly also a fine geometry, finite affine geometry. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's probably the reason that this comes in. I, you know, I, I don't have any more intuition than that, but that there's probably like a sort of global overarching reason why Singer sets come in here because somehow they're, they're um, yeah, something with finite projective geometry is related to MUBs, is related to projective toric designs, is related to these different sets. Uh, so I think that's kind of cool. And I would like to sort of, I wish I, yeah, I'd like to see that someone explain all of it uh, sort of in one go, be nice. So when you restrict to T equals two, then these BT, these different sets, BT mod M sets, 
they're now called side on sets. And I think these have a longer history of difference than distance sets, than different sets, sorry. Um, I've not, uh, and I think they're sort of well known for being very unstructured objects, uh, which is why I guess they're hard to study. And I think most of the study has been numeric, though I'm not so sure. Um, and if you take our lower bound on these projective designs, then projective torque designs for T is two, then you just get this. And if you just take the Singer construction, then you get these size torque design, projective torque designs. And so whenever n prime minus one, whenever n minus one is a prime power, then these Singer sets are, are minimal. Uh, and so this gives an infinite family of minimal uh, torque two designs, projective torque two design. Um, so it's in, it's in that sense that we know the bound is tight for T equals two in that the bound is saturated for infinitely many N. Uh, but we don't know if it can be saturated for every n. Uh, so there's a few examples that we don't know if it can be saturated, I think. Um, but there's a few examples that we know for sure um, that there's no difference set. Like you could just go, I think it's n equals seven, although I forget, but the, I think it's n equals seven. There's some small n where you can just enumerate all possible difference sets. And, so, and um, so we know for sure that for some small n, I think it was n is seven, you can't, you can't match this lower bound uh, via this different set construction of a projective torque design. But we don't know if that's the only way to construct a minimal projective torque design. So maybe, maybe there's another way to make a minimal one. Um, so now using these, using these Singer sets, these different sets, um, we can construct quantum state designs. This was, um, Again, this is sort of the original motivation for us anyways. <clears throat> um, yeah, so to, to say again, take the simplex design and concatenate it with the projected torque design, you get a quantum state design. And the simplex extremal points correspond to basis states. So just fix some basis and then decide that's the basis you're working with. And these extremal points get mapped via our, via our parameterization to these just basis states in C to the D. Um, and then the centroid becomes this uniform linear combination, uh, but then each, but uh, yeah, then the phases then come from a point on the projective torus, and so from a projective toric design, you get a whole bunch of <clears throat> a whole bunch of these linear com a whole bunch of these uh, vectors, each one corresponding to a, a, a point. And so this means that uh, Singer's the Singer sets these side on sets that Singer constructed. They yield sort of via this concatenation. They yield quantum state two designs of size d squared plus one whenever d plus one is a prime power. Uh, this might be a typo. This might be d minus one. I'm not sure. I think it's d plus one, but in any case, it should be written correctly in the paper. Um, and uh, sort of one thing that's kind of interesting about it is that. Um, Quantum state two designs are at 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 least size d squared, and they are size d squared if and only if they are also a sick POVM. Um, so here we get so that's why I sort of called this like an almost minimal quantum state design in the sense that it's one point more than <clears throat> than a quantum state than, than the sick POVM. Um, and right, so this is an in, this is now infinite family of almost minimal quantum state two designs. So this was sort of the first thing that we were excited about when we first found this out. Um, we, we, we thought it was the first, we thought it was the smallest infinite family known. Well, I mean, it, it is the smallest infinite family known because nobody knows of sick POVM, infinite families of sick POVMs. Like this is still a widely open thing in quantum information theory. So this is the smallest known infinite family of quantum state two designs. So we were kind of excited about that. And then eventually I later found that this was done a long time ago, 2016. They constructed these designs, but sort of in a totally different way. They were studying frame theory uh, uh, or finite frames and um, yeah, something sort of totally separate. And then kind of as a consequence of what they were doing, they found that, oh yeah, they also, these things also are these, these designs. Um, one, one sort of hope uh, which we haven't looked too much into, but is that our sort of construction hopefully generalizes to larger T. I mean, it does generalize to larger T in the sense that it, we have infinite families of projective torque T designs, 
And if you take uh, simplex T designs, then you get infinite families of quantum state T designs. Um, so the, the two sort of open things there are one, you need to find simplex T designs that play nicely with your projective designs. So this one was nice because of the way that we only, the toric part only interacted with the centroid. Um, so that was sort of uh, why this simplex design was nice. So you might want to try to find similarly nice simplex designs, <clears throat> T designs for, for larger T. Uh, and then if you take those and concatenate those with projective torque, with the singer's construct, the singer construction of projective torque T designs, then you'll get infinite families of these quantum state T designs. Um, but whether or not they are particularly small state designs, I think, yeah, that depends on, that depends on how good the project, the singer's construction of the torque designs are, and then also how good your simplex designs and how nicely they sort of intermingle, I suppose. Um, but in any case, this gives sort of an, yeah, an algorithm for constructing them. Uh, yeah, so let me, I can just, let me summarize. So I guess we studied, we studied projective torque designs and the relationship to various other mathematical objects. There were, uh, I guess, root lattices, crystal ball sequences, mutual land bias bases, um, uh, different sets and side on sets and I suppose some finite geometry, but, um, and we've, we constructed these sort of infinite families. So there's various sort of questions. I mean, sort of the main question, I don't know if I put it here, but maybe let me just say it. The main, the main thing that I think is interesting is just, I would like to understand better why all these things are connected. <laughs> and I suppose, uh, many people would in the sense that this, you know, con the connection between MUBs and project projective geometry has been, I think, an open question for a very long time. So I suppose maybe, but um, maybe this is one more thing to connect to all of them. I think it's kind of interesting. Um, more explicitly, uh, we'd like to know whether the lower bound on the size is tight. We'd like to prove that the, the, the lower bound is tight. Uh, you know, it'd be nice to prove that it's tight for all n, or it's, it's tight for infinitely many n. Uh, maybe it's tight for all n, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe not. Um, and like I said, we sort of conjecture that it's tight when T is even, not tight for all n, but tight for infinitely many n. Um, one way to make, I guess, progress on that is to decide if, is to figure out if minimal designs need to be group designs. Um, if so, you can work with, uh, can you know figure out all finite groups that you could have and then sort of rule out each one explicitly. So for example, for n equals seven or something, again, I kind of forgot. I think it's for n equals seven, since since it's since you know it's prime, if it's a group design, then it has to be a then it has to be a cyclic group. And then since it's a cyclic group, if it's if it turns out to be a design, it has to be a different set. The design has to come from a different set, and then we know that that difference by just exhaustive enumeration, you know that there are no different sets that match the lower bound for, uh, there. So if you could prove that minimal designs must be group designs, then you would prove that the lower bound is not tight for n is seven, for example. So there are sort of various things like that. Um, and then, like I said, there's sort of this not particularly, you know, this sort of rough connection to, to complete sets of MUBs which themselves are conjectured to be related to these affine projected planes. Um, so is there any sort of more explicit connection for these torque designs to be made there? Um, and then, right, so I said this earlier, are there nice simplex T designs to generate quantum state designs with our with these projected torque designs? Um, and then also sort of the analog of this for infinite dimensions, so these infinite dimensional quantum systems, quantum states, sort of space of temperate distributions, I think is a largely unexplored area. Um, and then finally, we sort of use this over and over again, the fact that if you concatenate uh, a simplex and a torus design, you get a, co a complex spherical design. And then if you have projective torque design, it gives you complex projective. Um, and fundamentally sort of the reason for this, oh, sorry, and the other thing is, right, if you take a projective torque design, you concatenate with a U1 design, then you get a torque design. And the fundamentally, the reason for this is that like, when you integrate over the complex sphere, uh, the complex sphere in terms of volume integration is effectively the same as a, as a simplex cross a torus. 
of course, it's not, they're not like the same as manifolds or anything, but they're sort of up to measure zero in some sense, they're the same. And that's why this works. Um, uh, I think it'd be interesting to prove it more, gen like to, I don't know, see how general that can be. And when, when can you just concatenate designs to get new designs? So can you do it for like a general fiber bundle or something, uh, integrate over a base manifold and then integrate over the fibers? Um, sorry, have a design on the base manifold and a design on each of the fibers and you sort of concatenate them in this twisted way as you go around the manifold to generate more, to generate designs on the full space. And this could be nice, for example, to build up uh, unitary designs from spherical designs because you have like you know, U of N mod U of N minus one is the complex sphere. So if you could sort of uh, recursively build up U of N designs by working with spherical designs, um, by sort of concatenating spherical designs with the fiber is U N minus one, but then you build your U N U N minus one design by another spherical design, et cetera. So you like recursively build them in this way. I think that's one kind of interesting thing. Um, yeah, so that's that's it. I, re I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Um, I think, I don't know how, how quite how I am on time. Hopefully that was roughly the right amount of time. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Joe. Let's thank our speaker by pressing a button that says reactions. And then you can choose your appropriate reaction. I'm going to choose a clap.